Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you for joining this session. It's very exciting for us to be able to connect everyone in so many different places, in so many different countries and locations. Uh, these are challenging times. It is, it is very, um, it's a very different situation that I have never experienced and we have never experienced in, in the residency. So we, we are very excited to have you all here. We are very happy that, you know, as these challenging times are, are happening, as we face these challenges, we're actually able to serve our community and, and to reconnect. And uh, so, so thank you for joining. And uh, of course, as you know, I am Francisco, I'm Puerto Rico of Arquitopia, that's my program coordinator. As usual, she's going to be coordinating the logistics and the structure of the program. So we're gonna have, this session is going to be dedicated to introduce each one of you to everyone, uh, including your project. So Nayeli is gonna keep uh, track of the time so that we're able to introduce everyone. So um, this residency is going to be to the theme of art, community building, and the fantasy of mobility which is a very broad theme. And one of the things that we're going to be doing is as we introduce ourselves, I'm going to be taking notes on each one of your projects, and then we'll figure out how to connect each other with specific readings. I have already a few ideas on the approach for the theme. I already uploaded the first uh, chapter, uh, in, which is the shady meaning of art. And uh, we are going to be thinking about the problem of art in general. These are all, most of them are all new readings for all of you. And as we go, I'll be including different readings and addressing questions in different ways. So we'll find a way to connect e either uh, through the technique or the themes or through the questions. So the program will actually change as we go. As, as you know, each one of our programs is actually um, individualized and it's actually made for each one of you, it's custom made. So we'll think about the possibility of reconnecting and, and working in different groups. So we'll figure that out as we go. Um, the, the residency in general is divided in four main themes. The first one is uh, the idea of art. We're gonna question that from the beginning. Then we're going to think about mobility and, and the problem of mobility and immobility as, as a fantasy that we all participate in. Uh, we're also going to begin thinking about artistic agency to figure out what we can do with our practice. And the last part of the, the residency is going to be about community building. So I'm also looking forward to brainstorming about the ideas in terms of uh, possible to collaborate, um, maybe an exhibition, maybe a studio, you know, whatever option we have. And as these uh, times are changing. We'll figure out what is possible and how we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, so for those who just signed in, it's important to keep uh, your microphone off until you have a question, because we have uh, so far 23 participants and it will be impacted otherwise with all the noise. This session is being recorded and will also be available for each one of you. Tonali, si puedes mantener tu, tu micrófono apagado. Y Sayani también. So that the audio is clear and we don't interfere with, with the question and the specific uh, you know, discussion that we're going to be having. So um, if you have any problems signing into the platform, because I've seen that most of you have and some of you haven't, please send an email to our info. Uh, info at architopia.org and I'll help you set it up so that you have access to the readings. Today we're not going to discuss any of the readings. This is for the next session, which is going to be Thursday at this same time. And uh, I'll ask you to prepare, I'm asking you to prepare all the readings, uh, write down questions, and from there we'll reconnect with our practice. So um, I have a list of participants here that I'm going to be asking in order, in, in the order that they each one of you enroll, so that we can cover each each one of uh, the introductions and to understand better what we do, where are we, etc. And to begin with, um, I want you to, of course, say your name, your location, 
the year in which you participated in the residency. So it's going to be your name, your location, including city and country, and the year in which you participated in the residency. Tell us a little bit more about your practice. What are the projects that you are currently working on? And if you have any questions that you are currently working on in regards to your project, anything that you are questioning, thinking about, each one of you is going to have around five to seven minutes, and Nayeli will keep track of the time. So she'll use her beautiful sign to let you know time's up so that each one of you will be introducing. Of course, we have in, in as part of the participants, uh, we have Tonali, she's our communication, uh, she's in charge of communication here in, in Arquitopia. So she recently joined the staff and we're really happy to have her as part of the session. And of course, uh, we have Christian Lima. He's also uh, our chef here in Puebla and he's also an artist. So he will also be participating. And we have uh, also Sayani. She's our site coordinator for the moment in Peru, in, in uh, Urubamba. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for joining. So um, as you have questions, well, first we're gonna cover the introduction and then we're gonna start discussing and then having uh, questions, et cetera. So, uh, turn on your microphone as you have questions, and then uh, we'll organize the questions as we go. So first of all, uh, I would like Jocelyn Salas to please introduce herself. Jocelyn, are you there? Yes, I was just trying to turn on my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jocelyn. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm Jocelyn Salas. I'm from New Mexico. I grew up in a small town called Cuba. Um, I'm living in Albuquerque right now. Um, I participated in um, Arquetopia residencies in 2014 and then um, last year during the summer 2019. Um, so Right now, I am working on a project that is based on a quilt that my grandmother made me. And um, it's very different than anything that I've done before because I, I've done a lot of drawing and painting, but now I'm working with textiles. So I'm working with weaving techniques and I'm working with sewing and embroidery. Um, and so this is all like super new, like I'm like dabbling in a bunch of like different types of um, techniques right now that embroidery seems to come the most natural to me, I think, because it's like drawing with thread. Um, but um, the other ones are a little bit more challenging. So um, that's where I'm at in, in terms of my process. And I'm working with questions about how we can make things that nurture others. Um, and I think it's really interesting that at this time, like a lot of people that can sew are being asked to like help create things to protect people like face masks and things like that. Um, I'm like currently working on headbands for my sister who's a nurse so that her ears don't hurt as much. So it's really interesting, um, like the possibilities that fabric can offer um, in terms of like being functional, but also artistic and nurturing. So the big question I'm working with is um, how do we nurture with the things that we make? And I'm also, I'm trying to incorporate um, embodied knowledge into this work um, because I've done a lot of work with my body in terms of dance and um, yoga and breathing. And, um, and so I'm trying to um, think about how this quilt that my grandmother made me has this relationship with my body and um and so I'm working with these ideas of you know embodied knowledge and nurturing and fabric so that's mm -hmm. what I'm working with now okay and now uh, how did you arrive to this project tell us a little bit more about the process from the idea the what triggered that all the way to the point where you're at now um, so I was working on a project with boxes and gold leaf about my family and family dynamics and, um, the roles that, um, or the role of like gender dynamics within my family. And I kept 
it never materialized. And then last year when I was at Arquetopia, um, I was working with a pattern from this blanket um, and I was thinking of it more in terms of painting and showing a place. And we talked about how th the difference between place versus space and how space can be actualized. And so uh, when I was thinking about painting the pattern like in a place versus my relationship with this blanket in space, then it really became apparent that my work needed to take a different direction. And so I think it was the readings and the ideas during my residency last summer that led me into a totally unexpected place with my artwork. Like yeah. I didn't expect it at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yes, to contextualize, uh, in, in the last few years, we've been, what, what Jocelyn is, is re referring to is we have been thinking about the problem of place and history. And as we keep thinking about our practice, we are going to challenge these notions. As we move, we encounter. And there are two conditions that we cannot alter so far, at least at this point in science and in the world and in the universe so far at this point, we cannot alter time and space. And as we think about time and space, space is a relationship. So much so that right now we've created this space in which we all are, but it's actually the space in which we are miles away from each other. So space is always a relationship. And time, although we can't necessarily define it immediately or as easy, we sense that it's happening and it's also a relationship with each other. Now, in contrast, space and place. Place is a version of space, but it's actually mapped and controlled. And this notion of place, uh, it emerged in the 16th century. It has a long history, but it actually became the dominant perspective and the dominant way to treat knowledge, communities, so on and so forth, since the 16th century. So art has a problem that we're going to begin unpacking, which is imagining, making everyone imagine that space can be distorted into place and that place is a reality when in fact it's always a construction. And in terms of time, it's very similar. Time gets distorted into history. So history and place are intertwined. And in the 19th century, as modern nations begin to emerge, we have been subject to a process in which we are placed in relation to the nation. So, you know, many of these problems will intersect with each one of your practice, and we'll think about these questions as we go. Thank you, Jocelyn. So uh, the next participant is uh, Victoria Leader. I don't know if Victoria is here. Yes, she is. Victoria, you can turn on your microphone. OK. If not, we'll come back to you. It might be that you have some issues with the computer. Um, so let us know when you're ready. We'll, we'll go to Fawn Douglas. She's can next. Fawn, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Hi. OK. See you. Hi. It was nice to see everybody. Um, uh, yeah, so I, my name is Fawn, Fawn Douglas. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada. And I attended Architopia in Oaxaca. Uh, for the summer of 2016. It was in August and it was beautiful and awesome. Uh, thank you for hosting this and um, bringing so many people together too. It's nice to see. Well, we have a roster of everybody who's attending so we could um, look at their work and, and such. Yes, oh. and, and we're actually going to have uh, part of the goal of the sessions and, and the residencies to figure out how we can work as a community. So we'll eventually connect with each other in terms of themes or techniques or you know, questions, and we'll have the, the emails available. And also I'm going to upload images that you submitted so that all of you can see the work that you're working on. And then from there, 
um, the different themes and questions will emerge. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my work, because uh, uh, I'm an MFA student at UNLV currently, I went back to, to get my master's and I was working in uh, sewing and stitch and traditional Paiute weaving practices, uh, large mural paintings, large scale. And then when everything started happening with the virus, my creativity went to zero. I haven't been able to make much except for masks. So I make these, I'm just sewing these masks. In fact, I took the kind of ribbon skirt-ish bo uh, bottom um, off of the bottom of my painting and used that fabric and ribbon to make masks for people in my tribe. We had a, a death in the family and they needed some masks right away. And so I was constructing those. So everything's been a, a part of making these masks and this call for this, this help and um, yeah, but creating anything outside that. Yesterday I finally cleaned out because uh, we're not allowed to use our studios at UNLV anymore. I mean, nobody can be on campus, of course, of course. Uh, so we had to bring all of our things home. And so yesterday I just started to, you know, clear out my, my garage and, you know, make a space to, to start creating things and get that, that fire going again. So I'm looking forward to some prompts and discussion and how we could uh, yeah, continue making art and what does that look like now? Um, and I really like what uh, Jocelyn said about like how we make to nurture and you know what we're what everybody else is doing right now to do something because I think that's what we're doing is trying to find um, reasons or not reasons, but um, opportunities to help where we can um, and to do what we can and using our, our skills for that. So um, yeah, but that's that's me. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us more about the last project that you were working on. What, what were the questions that you were thinking about, the techniques, you know, anything that you were wrestling with and working with? Um, well, before the masks, because the masks are just masks. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was told that they're arts as well, you know, because of the different fabrics and such. But before that, it was a really large scale. It was probably like, 20, 25 feet long, uh, nine foot tall. It was a really large canvas and it had the Seguro cacti from the, um, it was an article in the New York Times that was done on the destruction of the Seguro for the border wall. And I saw these pieces just laying against each other, these cacti. And for the Tohono O'odham people, the O'odham means the cacti and it also means the people like the word is interchangeable. So it's like the destruction of these people. So it was the, that with like a sunrise, sunset kind of fiery um, landscape. And then the, the ribbon skirts, cause we wear our ribbon skirts and each ribbon means something in our tribe or with the people. And that it's interchangeable too. I found out it was, uh, you know, with other tribes as well, they have similarities in the colors and the meanings of the ribbons. And I have that at the bottom with this really long, um, uh, green fringe to represent the roots and that our roots go deeper as native people, you know, even though there's destruction, it's just like we're seeds and we'll still, you know, continue even past this. So that was what my work was about. And, you know, the things that, cause I deal with indigenous issues, uh, not just with my own tribe, but, you know, others and things that are happening, especially within the Southwest. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vaughn. Yes, one of the points that you're raising that is very um, important is that we're going to tap in different sources of knowledge to understand the work that we do. Because one of the things that we have learned through the years is that although art is always against us, although art history is vicious in that sense and is always putting ourselves in, in, in a place in relation to the nation, what I have come to learn is that as artists, we are very committed to our practice in either sometimes we choose our questions, our problems, or the problems choose us. And these problems remain near us for many, many, many years, if not our lifetime. So I believe that artists have a possibility for solution. Now, it's not enough for our intention. You know, our intention is not enough to actually fix the problem because intention never remains in the work, but it's actually how we wrestle with the problem. And, and I always mention to artists, we need to shift the idea of an artist statement to actually make it a question. 
because it's not that our experience is not valid, but it's also not true that our experience is reality. It's one form of reality in an ocean of many different perspectives. So how we make our experience um, relevant in the process of change is actually to turn what we experience into a question. And as we go in the residency, we'll actually learn how to turn that intention, which is, uh, I, I, I shift the conversation into intuition, and from there, understand artistic agency, because artistic agency is what remains. I know a lot of these concepts are broad, so after the introduction, if you have if any of you have questions, feel free to ask them, and I'll be happy to respond. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Juan. Yes. So now, uh, Sandra Williams, please. Hi, I'm you know Sandra Williams, and I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska, and I actually just got back from Arctopia about four weeks ago, um, and so you know. It, I was going from February 16th to March 16th, 2020. Um, and, and so when I came home, I immediately had to go, the CDC recommended, you know, self-quarantine. No one checks on you in the United States. It's kind of just on our system. And then I used that time to completely refloor and redo my studio because I don't know how long I'm going to be not able to access my studio at school. And so I needed a really great place to work here at home. Um, I've been working on, I, I'm a cut paper artist, but I also do community-based arts, um, working with the, you know, geographically close, but socially distant neighborhoods surrounding the university. And um, I'm beginning to have my students work with senior citizens. Um, but, you know, that's all sort of up in the air right now. Uh, the cut paper pieces that I've been doing have been on this theme of Anthropocene, it's called Anthropocene Blues. Um, and I'm really preoccupied with the idea of hybridism, you know, like, what is that? Un is there an unbridgeable gap between, you know, human and animal? Um, you know, how close are we? Um, this, you know, idea of the chimera, you know, um, and, you know, I think the underpinning question that I've been struggling with is, you know, there are eco-feminist issues there, the idea that like women and people of color are treated in a very similar manner to like the environment. There's an element of disregard there. Um, but, you know, I in terms of, the Anthropocene in this time period where we have left an indelible mark on the earth that there is no going back from. And this virus is part of that, you know? Um, and it's interesting because, you know, climate change and the impact, it doesn't look anything like I thought it would be. And I'm also dealing with sort of my own mourning that, you know, for a long time, it seemed like a very distant idea, like something I wouldn't see during my lifetime. And then, you know, we are sort of full on faced with the impact of the Anthropocene right now. Um, and so, you know, the works, although I don't know that you would know these things by looking at them, you know, they are, that idea is sort of where um, all of the imagery springs from. Yes, thank you. Um, um, there are many really interesting questions when, when you post, um, when you present your project, because there are different instances in history, as we all know, in which these ideas are invented. And, and the reason you're precisely mentioning, the reason how the environment and, and women, whatever that even means, because it's also an invention just like nature, they do intersect. And we see, for instance, in 
through the 19th century and the early 20th century, how the idea of women, children, um, Indians, quote unquote, or indigenous, quote unquote, um, are more connected with the raw idea of art. That's where, for instance, modernists in Mexico were interested. This is why we see the work of Diego Rivera in such a way, with so many of the modernists, not only the, the big names. But yes, it is it is a process. And, and one of the things that um, as we're having this virtual session, we've been having different different programs online. Uh, one of the things that I, I keep mentioning to everyone is this is going to get worse. And we might not notice it because we're used to it. It's a process of extermination and the technology that was uh, put in place in the 16th century and will continue and it will get perfected. We made this system. However, as we encounter, there's a possibility for change. And let's remember that time and space is the only thing that is relevant. It's not even a thing, but it, it's, it's what's really relevant. And I understand we are all going through the process that is very difficult and complicated and, and not necessarily to ban or to organize in a specific way. But what I want to offer to all of you is bring some sanity into our space, meaning let's dedicate this space for that. And not necessarily to not talk about the crisis or talk about it, meaning let's commit to our practice as a possibility of time and space and, and how we bring some sanity and make sense of what we're doing here. So we'll explore many of these questions. And, and what I'm trying to say is it's going to be difficult because a lot of the readings are complicated and a lot of the readings, um, they're not made to bring hope to people or actually made to, to question many things, but as we wrestle with them, we will find a solution for our practice, not necessarily for global warming or climate change, but I, I do believe in change. And as I, you know, we didn't expect these many artists to be interested in the virtual residence. It's very exciting, you know, it is happening in many countries at the same time in one single space. And that's, that's, that's a privilege that we will take advantage of. And, together we're stronger so thank you all for for being part of this is very exciting and thank you um Sandra, because a lot of your questions are relevant to what we are experiencing and also many of the projects that we'll be thinking about okay mm -hmm. thank you so the next one is uh denise denise Bellezzo. are you online she's online okay well, if not, we'll send her to, to yes, we'll pass with, with the next one and then we'll come back to this. Mark. Uh, Mark Harris. Okay, I think I'm on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, Mark. Hello, Mark. How are you? Good to see Hi, you. Hi, how are you doing? It's good to see you. It's really well. great to be part of this again. Um, I'm Mark Harris and I live in Newark, Delaware. Uh, and I was at Architopia um, in 2018. And uh, I was involved in a project then in which I was trying to, um, uh, I'm a printmaker and I was doing a woodblock prints of uh, the faces of a variety of people involved in the Mexican art world and political world following the First World War and following the Mexican Revolution. And the idea was to, to produce those both as uh, fine arts work, but also to uh, use them in the form of public art uh, in terms of pasting uh, these uh, prints on a wall, that kind of thing. And so I ended up doing that as a project uh, which which ended up being a show at a regional art museum here in Delaware, uh, in which I had the fine art versions of the prints in frames, looking very nice and you know ready to go, and plastered on the back wall were all these pictures with things like uh, resist and um, uh, you know arise and words that went with it. Out of that project grew the idea of. Um, 
wanting to try to find ways to express either um, in terms of concrete visual expression or in abstract ways, a visual expression of a verbal uh, statement like arise or take over or uh, revolt or uh, resist. So you'd have the word resist, but with it, you would have something that would go with it. And so I did, uh, I've been working on that and that's the, the, the place I'm going to now, but it's raising interesting personal issues. Um, many of the words are the words of um, protest and revolution. And I am a person of considerable privilege. I mean, you know, I mean, I hang out, I mean, I'm, I, I'm under house arrest, as it were, but the house arrest is pretty nice. I mean, I'm in, I'm in a location where um, I have all the food I need and I don't have to worry about things and just get through this and come out the other side and everything will be fine. But that's a fairly privileged place to be. So what am I doing using these kinds of words? How do I adopt, how do I appropriate these words as words that have to do with my own future? Um, well, one of the things that happened was that I did a little woodblock of three hands. My mother had done um, uh, um, ceramic molds of the hands of her two, no, of her mother and her mother-in-law, that is to say my grandmothers, and then did the hand of my wife, Catherine. So I have these porcelain hands. And so I then took a photograph of that and then did a woodblock from that. So I've got these three hands and they're all sort of rising up in the air. And over the top of that, um, uh, I, uh, I then use one of these expressions. Um, and, um, and it really changed the way I both thought about their work as um, they were all strong women um, and um, how I looked at that in terms of um, sort of appropriating some of their values as my own. So that gave me a kind of a hint about ways I could relate to these kinds of expressions. So that's kind of my project right now is to sort of work at putting together kind of a catalog of, um, of verbal expressions that are accompanied by um, works of art. That's it. I don't know where it's going to go, but you know, that's a good starting place. Um, the project is in part um, connected to some very long-term involvements I've had with things like the Bread and Puppet Theater. Um, which has done remarkable work in trying to do visual expressions of, um, of, of um, political concepts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and out of my own work, I guess for years as a, as a social activist in trying to make that stuff connect. That's where I am. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think that what is very, not I think, I, I, what I find really interesting in, in your project is how, because when we see space distorted into place and then time distorted into history, I argue that there's a possibility of a layer of distortion that can correct that. And as we look at history as, as an invented narrative, and eventually as we start looking at other possibilities of other histories and our they incorporate it, there's always an issue and a question of translation. And translation could be a form of distortion. And when I see how your project uh, begins by thinking about this encounter with these women, uh, but in a very clever way without necessarily thinking about gender, the hands are translated into a sculpture and then sculpture into a photo and then the photo into a print. It's a very interesting process of translation. Now, the other question that we will have to think about is also the process of reading. 
how translation really how, how to it. yeah the process of how we read how we okay. read yeah, yeah, yeah. Images, how images get translated and then how they're read is also a very interesting possibility for uh, these questions to be inserted mm -hmm. so one of the, uh, the example of the, exactly this issue is the 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 particular woodblock that I did of the hands, the word was presente. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's the word that was used particularly in El Salvador as a way of uh, calling forth the names of those who had been incarcerated or killed during the course of, of a long struggle, you know, right. and you would call up their names and they would say present, mm -hmm. meaning that they were called into our presence, right? right. So So for me, one of the kinds of questions is how do I call into my presence the strength of these women to deal with the issues that we have to deal with now? Right. Yes, we're going to answer that question and Nayeli's already signing me up that it's time up. So, but we're going to answer that question by thinking about encounter because one of the, the big uh, possibilities, the great possibilities when we think about encounters is that um, we need to understand that whoever we encounter is great before we encounter them and after we encounter them. And in that sense, it also brings into question and, and it makes it relevant that we are more than the body, more than what we embody. So when we connect with these people that have transcended, that are not necessarily physically in whatever um, meaning we, we try to understand that, uh, they're still being able to connect with us in different ways. Not necessarily to go into any religious or religion of any form, but to think about these larger questions philosophically. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. So now I see Denise. Oh, yes. yes. Please introduce yourself, name, location, years of your residencies. Oh, that me. <laughs> and... <laughs> What projects are you currently working on? Okay. Um, I am in Naperville, Illinois. And uh, we had, I had a residency in Peru, which we just returned from. And um, so 2020 and a residency in Puebla, 2019, 2017, and 2016. So I'm a four-year veteran. <laughs> Survivor. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think Peru really tested our or my sense of place and space. Um, but uh, so now we're back and um, trying to make sense of um, our practice mm -hmm. or my practice and um, trying to work with some of the uh, dyed papers that I made um, in Peru. Um, I have a number of the dyed yarns and I don't know how that is going to work. If I, I want to draw with the sewn line or if I want to use it as a filler. But um, so I have the wool that uh, I still have to work on. And I don't know if you can see that, see my wool. And um, I have uh, back to these papers and I made a number of um, about 20 sheets with the different dyes. And the whole time that we were making them, I wanted to use bleach to on them and to work with a bleached line. So I was able to do that when we got home. And it's, it's kind of like making intermittent unintentional marks on the surface um, and then deciding if I want to make intentional lines. I, I go back and forth, but it, I, it seems to be part of the um, thinking process. There's there's a little bit of distortion of, of some of the um, pieces as well as uh, an idea of um, some of the plant forms that I use and some of the markings that I have with the um, sidewalk um, design. So that's that's where I'm at right now. 
and um, I'm interested in some of the things that you talked about intention turning uh, to intuition and um, translation and distortion. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the sidewalk project? How did you arrive to that project site? I know it very well. We had it in, in, in an exhibition in our gallery here in Puebla, but to share a little bit more of the context of that project with, with the rest of the participants. The sidewalk um, photographs mm -hmm. provided me a surface to work on top of. And um, it started with the uh, plot drawings that I found in the uh, antique store. And uh, those were plots of the area around where I live. And the, so the sidewalk ones became a way that I could um, document where I'm at in terms of the place um, that I visited. So many of them are from Puebla or San Cristobal. Um, uh, in Mexico. So the, those are the, the ones that seem to give me a variety of um, ideas when I look at them and what I can impose um, upon them. So that's, the, um, that's where the, the, that sense of space and place, mm -hmm. I think, play into the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. yes, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Yes, the we are going to keep thinking about space and place because uh, although in the 16th century, this generalized idea of uh, place was invented, there are many ways, as you're mentioning, in which space can be reactivated. And, and one of the things that we have looked at when we think about Mexico and Peru as, as two examples is that the sense of place didn't exist as we understand it today. It's actually our geographical location, for instance, in Mexico and in, both in Peru. Uh, it was the location of the individual in relation to the four corners, north, south, east, west. And then an axis that connects the different layers of the different worlds. So, for instance, in Mexico and Mesoamerica, it was a connection with the underworld, which is where our ancestors live, and it's very familiar. It's not this disconnected idea of heaven, hell, earth, but it's actually a very dear place that we are very familiar. And also the superior world, to put it in, in very simplistic ways, which is also very familiar. And that axis would be time. So time and space in relation to our position. And you know, there are many other ways of thinking about these uh, relationship with each other, and we, we will explore them as we go. So thank you, Denise. The next participant is uh, Taylor Lee. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hola, Hi, Taylor. Taylor, how are you? Hi, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> yes, um, I'm happy to meet everyone here. I haven't seen any of my, my fellow residents yet. Maybe their camera's not on though. But um, yeah, I'm Taylor Lee. And I am in Charlotte, North Carolina in the United States, of course. <laughs> um, I was in Puebla in 2017, so it's been several years now. And back then I was working mainly on painting and I was doing a lot of abstract painting, but a lot has changed since then. <laughs> I'm in a place right now with my work that's extremely exploratory. Um, I really decided to just go for it and try a bunch of different mediums. So I've been working most recently with animation, painting, wearable sculpture, um, photography a little bit. I'm really just working on having an overarching um, like themes or questions in my work that I can explore in a lot of different mediums instead of having to be confined to a specific thing. And some of these themes that I am exploring right now have to do with visual culture, escapism via media, um, thinking about Baudrillard's hyper-reality, um, the quiet apocalypse. <laughs> David Foster Wallace talks about this in Infinite Jest. This kind of stuff, especially related to social media, 
Um, I'm extremely active on Instagram and I've seen periods of my life over the past few years where simulation became reality. And I'm kind of in that mode of getting it back to being more rooted in reality, um, kind of alternating back and forth here, just exploring what's going on there. <laughs> so I'm also working with these themes in my work about isolation versus community, um, kitsch versus high art, things that are fickle or silly versus things that are deep or serious. And I'm really trying, one of my biggest takeaways from my residency at Pueblo was trying to make art that raised more questions rather than statements, which you already brought up earlier on this call. Um, Cause I think I used to try to make a lot of statements <laughs> and now I'm trying harder to just say, okay, here are some things I'm noticing. This is, um, this is what I'm making in reaction to it, but I'm really just trying to stay open and see what, see what happens through the work. Um, I'm using a lot of color. I try to use laughter as well as pathos to create these, um, these pieces. So as far as specific projects, I've been working a lot with animation lately. I'm trying to do a web series. It's stop motion. And I've created these characters. Um, if I tilt my camera, I think you can see I have a sun and a moon paper mache mask that I made and this um, floral outfit that I'm starting. I've covered the whole thing in flowers and I'm experimenting with making that living. Right now it's silk, but I want to work with living flowers maybe and seeing what's the relationship between these characters. And um, I'm also thinking of creating things within visual culture, such as gifts, um, stickers that people, you know, text with each other, these kinds of things that are sources of language in our current world, you know, like gift back and forth and send animations or send um, like text speak, all that stuff. So I'm trying to kind of operate within those mediums as well. So yeah, like I said, it's all very exploratory and I'm very open to seeing where it goes, but I'm really excited about it. This is very exciting. Thank you, Taylor. Um, the, the, you're, you're right, raising very uh, relevant questions in terms of time and space, because actually, as, as we think about, for instance, um, Instagram, it originates in the late, I think, 18th century, 19th century, um, early 19th century, with the cloud glass. So when we begin thinking about mobility in, in the chapter that we have, and we'll unpack the problem of place, we're going to stumble on the picturesque, which is also connected to the idea of color and how color has been used as a way of classifying. Uh, when you talk about the hyper-reality and this, this idea of the reality effect, it's wonderful because we can also introduce it as a way to understand how the more we try to, the more real things seem to be in art, once we see them, the more um, we understand they are invented. So the reality effect has this uh, goal of, of um, making you believe that what you're seeing is reality. And we're going to explore some of the absences in art. And, and some of you have already explored them in different readings, specifically Linda Nocklin's um, the imagined, um, imaginary orient, I think is the title, and we'll explore that reality to, to rethink, because as we see how art had a function in relation to power and how it became a visual expression of moral judgment, we see beauty used as an excuse for extermination, then aesthetics, then irony. So a lot of the questions that you're raising have to do with this idea of how this form of moral judgment has been transforming itself, but yet it keeps reactivating um, forms of moral judgment that we've seen in the past as a method for extermination. Now, it doesn't mean that we are going to judge artists in that sense, because remember, intention never remains in the work. 
but we're going to explore how our history organizes them in relation to power. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Taylor. Wonderful. Thank you. So now, um, Elise Dawson. Elise, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Okay, that was hard. Okay. Looked. Hi. Hello. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. So my name is Elise Dawson. My preferred pronouns are she, her, or they. I'm a visual artist from Winnipeg, which is in Manitoba, which is in Canada. And I participated in Architovia's 2017 residency in performativity and mortuary rituals. So thinking of place, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work in the territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Dene, Métis, and Oji Cree nations. So my studio sits in Treaty 1 territory, which is the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe peoples. So we honor the treaties here and Treaty 1 was signed in 1871. And that of course took the territory from the local First Nations in order to make the land available for settlers like me to use. So my artistic practice is pretty restless. I, uh, I cross a lot of disciplinary boundaries. I do performance. I wrote a poetry book since actually coming back from Architopia. I do drawing, photography, and painting, as well as video. Um, I'm really interested, I think, in seeking that tension between vulnerability and witnessing. Um, I'm a current media artist in residence at Video Pool. I've been exploring new media there to me, like field recording and augmented reality. But because of the pandemic, I don't have access to any of that technical equipment anymore. So I've been occupied with kind of compulsively painting drawing and digital collaging. Um, I believe I shared some paintings in progress of some pillows and some unmade beds that I painted recently. Um, ultimately, I think I'm interested in sort of questioning the utility of art in preserving a human experience or in describing something that feels so impermanent. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh could you tell us a little bit more about how you arrived to these paintings of the unmade beds? Yes. So I've been working on a series of paintings for the last two years. Um, and I got back from a recent trip and I basically decided to do a performance alone in my studio uh, without kind of any documentation. I work as a photographer. So my actual professional job is documentation of art. Um, so I didn't want to do any of that, and I decided that I would paint over all of my paintings black. Um, so they kind of exist painted behind this black gesso still, and I thought it would kind of create this illusion of a new site to work, like something that appears new to me, yet still having all of this history hidden behind it. And I thought the idea of painting a bed, an unmade bed specifically, was particularly clever because I thought it was sort of like a palimpsest itself, um, a palimpsest, something that you sort of write over and make new again. Um, so these new, I felt like a bed was also kind of like a palimpsest in that you kind of, it's familiar to a lot of people, especially um, in Western viewpoints, we're familiar with this bed as this site of the unconscious almost. It's like a site where we sleep, we fuck, we eat, even a site of sickness now, you, you could say. Um, anyway, I, fe I felt like there's all of these, all of these things that exist within the bed as this site that make it interesting as a palimpsest in that it kind of leaves the traces of everything in that. So I chose the bed as a subject matter to mm -hmm. paint over these, paintings, which kind of already have paintings existed in them. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you for um, this, this very um, clear way of understanding territory, because it, it's always uh, necessary to, to, for everyone to understand where we're at and 
And that we're always standing on the legacy of discrimination. That's that's a reality. Mm -hmm. And I see this wonderful connection between these very clear conscious and awareness of that with the idea of beds. Because when we explore the notion of, of play and how space is supported into play, the home emerges in the 19th century mm -hmm. as, as one of the most dangerous places in the world. It doesn't mean necessarily that our home is dangerous and we have to be safe. Mm -hmm. But it's also uh, fascinating to understand how sentimentality created this notion of the home, how it became domestic, and how with that frame of domesticity, everyone was reorganized, and how gender became the new form of ideological discourse mm -hmm. that the nation could emerge. So there are many interesting questions when we think about the home. Many interesting questions to rethink plays, especially now that we are um, in our homes and our homes become our place of resistance, of play, uh, of history, but also they become public spaces in, in certain moments. So we'll explore all of that as part of the notion of uh, play. Thank you, Elise. Thank you. So now um, we want to ask Neely Gleason to please introduce herself. No, Neely, are you there? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Neely. Hello. I don't think my camera is working, but can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Excellent. Okay, so hello, I'm Millie Gleason. I'm from Glastonbury in the UK. Um, I have recently done a Archetopia residency in Peru um, and before that in 2018 in Puebla. So um, where to begin? I am a predominantly a painter, um, so I work uh, usually painting portraits, generally women, and it kind of got more into painting myself, mainly from the Archetopia in 2018, um, following the readings of um, The Shadow, um, Lebanesian Ethics. Um, so it kind of became more to do with um, the self that I then the space between, um, which is kind of what I've been carrying on working with. So the, the last residency, it was still kind of aimed at that. Um, so I'm still still painting aspects of myself and other people and uh, yeah, uh, distortions, fractions, that kind of thing. Um, I'm a little bit stuck at the moment, um, I guess because of what's going on in the world. Um, it's kind of brought up a lot of isolation ideas and having the the residency in Peru I kind of was dealing with a kind of isolation in itself so when I was coming back so it was just kind of before the lockdown um I kind of was excited to get out and to see people and, and to interact because I'm quite a hermit myself and I kind of felt like I've been through a whole few years of a process of kind of learning myself and then I wanted to get back out there um and so it's quite strange to now have this kind of uh imposed isolation that I've been imposing on myself for quite a while anyway um and I'm finding it slightly difficult to connect with painting so I've started doing a lot of journaling and writing lists and kind of getting thoughts and ideas out. And I'm feeling that my work's going to take on a, a different note for the next while, maybe work with different materials um, to kind of relearn how to explore and play rather than being so fixated on making something complete and finished and um, polished, I guess. 
Um, I think it would be it's quite an interesting time just to kind of completely step away from what you're comfortable with and almost relearn yourself and and explore. So that's kind of where I'm at, at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you, Millie. Yes, we are going to explore uh, how these space can actually allow us to rethink our practice because we, we have to make do with what we have. We have to rethink uh, the relationship with community. We have, so a lot of us have been stuck at some point in the process of, of rethinking our practice and specifically with the readings. Um, what is very interesting about your practice and, and I'm going to upload images of each one of your uh, work, each one of you so that you can see the work that we're talking about and you can contextualize it and from there new possibilities of, of reconnection will happen. Uh, and what uh, Millie is talking about in terms of the shadow is what uh, most of you have already experienced in the residence when we think about the process of art making and how we project light. And this is specifically referring to the reading, performing the body, performing the text, meaning we embody, but also we create a body when we create an artwork. Once we release the body, it becomes text because it's readable. The problem with the text or the challenge that we face with the text is that as we read it, it's independent from our perspective as artists. The art world will actually outlive us and will also ha have a happy life beyond and without our consent as artists. Most artists not necessarily agree with how their work is being interpreted in context, but it doesn't matter because the text is independent from the intention of the artist. So that means that the only possibility for change, and as we explore all these ideas of social change, is the process of making the body. And as, as you all remember, we negotiate with the body. We are essentially the first audience of this body. We read it. We negotiate with it, we read it, we negotiate with it, and then eventually we'll release it. As we make this body, we project light into these different possibilities, um, different uh, universes of meaning, and we select specific concepts, we bring them to the forefront, and we start playing with them, with the grammar of art. This is what makes our work relevant, interesting, powerful. Mm -hmm. Now, when we project light, we also project shadow. And the shadow is the negative aspect of the work, the possibility to, for our work to connect with the structures that reproduce hate. This is what is very scary. Now, the shadow is never our shadow. It's not that as artists, we have flaws and we put that in the work because nothing remains in the work. Uh, meaning is always taking place as the work is being encountered. So, the shadow is never a shadow, it's specific to the work. And as the work changes, the shadow also changes. Now, the shadow is also not the lack, it's actually um, not the lack of something. It's, it's not, for instance, the lack of knowledge or the lack of technique or the lack of resources or the lack of time. It is the hateful potential that the work will have when you release it into the world. The reality is that on one hand, the shadow will never go away. The shadow will remain with the work. And once we release it, it sort of becomes stable, sort of because through time, it will change. And as interpretation and our history reorganizes meaning, it would also change. But on the other hand, as we think about the shadow, and the shadow is never our identity, never. It's, it's usually something that is connected to the process of making, to the questions that we have, but it's not our identity. As we think about these shadows, we immediately begin working with them, even if we don't know what we're doing, which is very often, and, and that's how we feel. That's why we are anxious. We might not know what we are doing, but we're actually addressing the shadow. So what I always convey to artists is to think about the shadow. As you see the shadows, as you see them creeping into the work, you will start addressing them immediately. It doesn't matter how, because you will address them. 
And the reality is that shadows will remain in the work. But once you release it, because of the complexity of the process of dealing with these different shadows, the structures of power will not know how to handle the work, will not know where to place it, will not necessarily fit in a very specific narrative. So we'll continue to explore these ideas as we go. Thank you, Mila. Thank you. So now um, we want to ask Jesse Lewis to please introduce herself. Hello, can you hear me? Jesse. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. How's it, how's it going? Very good. Very good. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm Jesse, uh, Jesse Lewis, and I am from South Africa. Um, Johannesburg, the city is Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, I'm currently living in Mexico City, kind of by accident, but I'm here and now I can't leave. So, um, there's yeah. And um, I was, I did the residency in Puebla in September last year, um, and then I've been here ever since. Um, I went, I was doing the um, self-directed ceramics residency. So I do ceramics. Um, I have, uh, my main background is in film. Um, so I was worked, worked in film and made films and wrote films for a long time. Well, not that long, but for a long time, uh, as long as I could handle. And, um, I kind of, but always doing visual arts on the side. Um, and I started doing ceramics um, about three, four years ago. And that's now what I do. Um, and yeah, I, I live next door my studio. So that's, I mean, here in Mexico. So that's been very, like, that's very lucky. I can still go there and work, which I feel very lucky about. And um, I have been, my work, um, I work mainly, I mean, my work generally falls on themes of like, it started with, with kind of looking at like my family's journey from Poland during World War II to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's generally surrounding themes of like family, uh, forced migration and home is like the general, uh, what like the overarching theme of my work um and going to Akitopia I started looking more at domesticity and what that meant to me um particularly the kind of I mean when I when I arrived at Akitopia I was like I'm working about nostalgia and memory and blah blah blah, blah. and then like when I left I was like I'm working about loneliness and like violence and suffocation and discomfort so that's kind of what i've been doing now um i'm yeah i kind of make like i i make useless ceramics like not functional um more sculptural and um um through that i make i mean i make a lot of little characters and figurines and um with those i kind of create domestic scenes um yeah, and late, like in the last two weeks, I've been making more like functional things, which is not, but I was just like staring at the wall in the studio, like, what the fuck am I going to do? And then I started making some functional things and incorporating writing a bit more into that and words, which I haven't done a lot of. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. and, I, oh, and I'm making knives, like uh, ceramic knives, but life sized ones. So that's mm -hmm. been fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit more about that journey in which nostalgia turned into uh, facing loneliness, for instance. How you, because the themes that you are exploring are, are wonderful and, and very relevant to understand history and understand place in terms of space yeah. and time. So tell us a little bit more and, and, and expand a little more on, on, on how you started that journey and where you're at at this point. Um, I think um, I think I was always saying those things, but I didn't want to say that I was saying them. I think maybe not to offend my mother or something like um, 
Um, but I, I've like for the for a long time, I've made a lot of like um, a lot of my characters are like crying or screaming or hanging themselves or ah. And um, so um, I think just through discussions with you, specifically through the, I mean through some of the readings on domesticity. Um, I think I was also I was also scared to to use terms like domesticity because I didn't want to make work about gender because mm -hmm. I was like no nah, that's not like what my work is about but when I started thinking of it more it's like the suffocation of domesticity the banality the repetitiveness um, and realizing that's what I wanted to say and also um, thinking more about performance and how I perform within my domestic space, even though it's supposed to be where I'm most comfortable, um, thinking about um, performance really helped. And that feeling, I mean, I know I've always had feelings of like being watched, not like so, not like someone's watching me, but like because you're performing, you always feel like you're being watched and you're on display. And yeah, so I think just changing how I thought about things and actually making my thought patterns fit with what I was making more. Well, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Because we will continue to explore the idea of home and uh -huh. continue to figure out our relationship with home and how this uh, reality of how we perform is in connection to place and history more than space and time. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And thank you for doing this. This is so oh. nice. Thank you. Uh, so now let's go back to Victoria to see if she's already online. Victoria, are you there? Hi. Can you hear me? We can barely hear you. Can you hear me? Um, is this a little bit better? Yes, yes. better. Hello, Much Victoria. better. Hi, good to see you. Hi. Sorry, I had some technical issues. Um, good to see you. <laughs> yes, I'm fine. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm currently in Cuba in Canada, um, but I arrived here very recently. I had to, um, I, I live between the UK and Canada and I had to quite suddenly emigrate from the UK uh, with everything happening. I plan to move back to Canada next month, um, but as it turned out, it happened sort of within 24 hours instead. So that was quite a lot. Um, my family is split between um, the two places, so that's sort of a constant theme in my life, the, um, the movement between the UK and both areas of Canada. Um, I'm actually not where I'm supposed to be um, yet either, due to just sort of some domestic travel restrictions and things. Um, so that's sort of um, a bit of a theme for me right now. Um, and um, I was um, on residency in, um, in Peru uh, with Triani uh, for about a year and a half ago now, um, in December. And it was a really transformative process for me. I kind of came with a lot of um, uh, like specific ideas that I quickly dropped um, after sort of the initial readings and things. And it's been a really pivotal point for me in my life. And my practice since then has changed quite drastically. Um, before that point, I was doing a lot of portraiture, um, and a lot of um, my work is um, sort of comes from Indian art. I spend a lot of time in India, and um, my teacher um, is is Indian from North India, and I study a lot of miniature painting and, and yoga. So that's informed a lot of what I was doing, and um, I've been questioning more than ever um, the sort of place of a Western voice within that space, and. Um, taking some time to think about that rather than just kind of persevering with you know, producing images that I thought looked good <laughs> before. Um, so since since um, since the residency, I've essentially been working on a lot of projects um, questioning um, like the the ethics and the voice of the other. Um, and my job in the UK was to work within the travel industry and. It, I mean, I was resistant to it, but my literal title was India Specialist, um, which I didn't quite understand how somebody like myself could uh, claim to be a specialist of another nation. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that was just the title. I, all I was doing was selling holidays to India to see if I could reach 
um, people from the UK. So it was a really uncomfortable role to be in, um, but I actually decided to use um, that position um, to not only educate myself, but to try to influence directors within that company um, so that especially like around like the marketing material and, and some of those um, cases to try and come to better practices. Um, working on a team within the company um, who we, we looked at sort of, um, like for example, removing all images of children from marketing brochures and then just looking at the way that we're representing other communities and still very aware that um, by no means um, uh, we as like a Western company the, the experts on how we should be representing other communities in the first place. So just exploring those ideas um, and my art in itself has kind of um, been put on the on the side as I've continued to explore some of some of those ideas. Um, and part of that work was um, I've been involved in an evening course um, exploring international ethics and global justice and kind of developing more um, I don't know Sort of reading more um, into that area. So my, my last project is actually an essay on conditional aid and neocolonialism, which I've abandoned during this move from the UK to Canada. So that's sort of on the back burner now. Um, in essence, I, I don't really know um, one where I am <laughs> and two what I'm working on um, because of all this movement and this change. I mean, there's a lot of um, movement within my life that's definitely a theme. Um, and um, and I'm also without any of my usual materials right now because I just brought what I could in a in a bag on on the plane. Um, so I'm really open to being in this space. I'm really grateful that this has come up at this time because it feels like a, an excellent opportunity to um, to be open to ideas, to you know potentially connect with others, and um, and and to sort of dive back into practice with a little bit of guidance on some of these huge topics. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, yes, you're, you're also raising very interesting questions that will connect with, with the process in which we are uh, all immersed. Because as, as we look at history and we see the invention of, of the problem of the encounter that we're actually going to challenge and we're going to rethink encounter, not as it is rooted in in the 16th century and the imagination of uh, what uh, people think about in terms of Western, which Western, I never use Western, and we'll address that in one of the readings because Western is a culmination of everything horrific that has happened to everyone. Nobody's exempt from Western um, as a process of extermination, but it's not really a place. It's not really a community. It's not really, it's, it's a way we frame and accept power in a way that is not, uh, it creates an impossibility of name. So what we're going to do is challenge all these notions and to rethink what we mean when we think about another who approaches us, another that we encounter. So it's not a historical other that has created in, in this fantasy of an anxiety towards who is different from Western, but it's actually how we understand um, the reality of non-dominant differences. So when we get also, when we get to mobility, we'll think about the problem of how we place ourselves in relation to power, meaning nations, meaning all these uh, geographical positions, including the invention of Western. When we move into community and community building, we will also think about non-dominant differences as a source uh, of power that we have and, and whenever we encounter remembering that there's friction and these frictions create sparks and these sparks are very painful because they burn the deep process of burning and friction creates change and change cannot be predicted if change is predictable it's not change it's one of those master tools and many of you remember that reading so we'll think about what is the possibility of change when we encounter and from there, what is our responsibility to bring back a conversation about ethics into everything, every encounter that we have? Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Victoria. So um, now we want to introduce, I don't know if Amanda Kaufman is online. She said she was going to be on, on and off, depending on her job schedule today. 
<laughs> if still let us know. Um, also, a reminder to keep your microphones off so that whoever is um, term to, to speak is clear. Please turn your microphones off. And um, then we want to introduce Camila Salcedo. Camila, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Hola. 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 ¿Cómo estás? How are you? Bien, ¿y ustedes? Muy bien, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, you too. Um, cool. So my name is Camila Salcedo. Um, I was born in Venezuela and I immigrated to Toronto with my family which is where I currently live. Um, I went to art school in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is in Canada's East Coast and uh, moved back to Toronto in September. Um, I've done two residencies with Arquetopia, one in 2018 in Oaxaca and one last year in Cusco. Um, <clears throat> so my art practice overall is uh, interdisciplinary. I dabble <laughs> in a few different mediums. Um, mostly textiles, video, and performance. Um, I also have a curatorial practice, but I don't want to limit myself to just one medium. Um, I always like learning new things. Um, two current projects I'm currently participating in is one is a collective. Myself and other artists have recently started called Satellite. Um, we're a group of emerging artists currently based in Toronto. Um, Right now, because of everything happening, we're spending a lot of time thinking about how we can help each other survive financially, <laughs> um, but also how we can care for each other uh, during this hard time. Uh, one of the projects that we're doing as a collective is actually an online dance party via Zoom mm -hmm. called Cuarenteca. So myself and Ana Luisa, we DJ, um, anyone who has internet access is invited to join and we come together, we dance once a week. Um, we know that the music we play is not for everyone. We play a lot of reggaeton, which is like very problematic in many ways. <laughs> um, but it's been like a really fun way to come together during social distancing and isolation. I've also been thinking a lot about how um, as a Venezuelan abroad, who is one of like, five million right now and counting um, Venezuelans abroad, this experience of like video chatting is really familiar to me um, and how actually like this whole experience of the pandemic is kind of validating that experience in a way or kind of like allowing more spaces to occur. So it's actually kind of nice because um, I'm able to share links with my family and friends um, that before were kind of like perhaps more tied to like a physical space. Um, so that's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, yeah, so like music has always been separate to my visual arts practice, but lately it's kind of more blurred. Like um, this DJ practice is kind of part of my art practice <laughs> right now. Um, also, in the last year since uh, being in Arquetopia, I was there like around a year ago in Peru. I've been thinking a lot about community and what it means, um, how it can be fostered, what I can bring to the process of community building. Um, also recently, I've started to read about the idea of hope. So um, through like Bell Hooks, Rebecca Solnit, um, a few different authors, um, and I'm interested in learning how, like, we can foster hope in community, especially during difficult times, um, and how we can connect with communities via online platforms. Um, like, I'm thinking about, like, the possibility of online performances, like, other than, obviously, this dance party, um, like, live streaming, um, and how participants and communities can join kind of a platform like what we're doing right now, um, but using the theme of hope as the main idea. Um, I'm not sure like how to do it or how it would come about, but that's kind of, it's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, like I want to have conversations about hope because with change being so unpredictable, um, what are ways that we can like welcome that change, I guess? Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now. Thank you, thank you, Camila. Yes, 
one of the things that we are going to also explore is that since the 16th century, and I know I sound like a broken record, but a lot of these problems are <laughs> important to contextualize them. Uh, the meaning of words has been kidnapped. We, we are used to a tradition in which words and the meaning, although we understand each other, or we, we think we understand each other, when we say them in context, they mean something else. And nothing could be more relevant right now, like, for instance, democracy. We think about democracy in one way, how democracy actually functions is very different to what we imagine. So when we choose terms, we also have to think about what are they performing and for whom. And, and I usually change, uh, frequently change the conversation from these terminologies to understand how is intuition functioning to understand that there's layers of meaning, layers of knowledge and layers of resistance that we can tap into. So it's not that hope means only this, or it doesn't mean this, or it can't mean that. It's actually what you sense in that term that has allowed you and many others to resist. And the important mm -hmm. part is to find the epistemology of that, not necessarily the epistemology of the word, but to understand how the meaning is performing, being performed, and what kind of structure of knowledge we are talking about. Because that opens the door for many possibilities. The problem that I see with hope is that it's a form of empathy. And it mm -hmm. makes everyone imagine that they're doing something when we're actually we're just sitting. Mm -hmm. and we're not doing necessarily, but how hopes interacts with modernity is a problem. It doesn't mean that I'm disqualifying hope or religion mm -hmm. or, or the possibility of resistance. It's how we need to rethink how the meaning is being performed in relation to the structures of knowledge, because there's something that you are intuitively finding there that is relevant, powerful, and also very interesting. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. Now we're going to ask how to the Madeleine uh, line and it's actually online. Paco, yeah. perdón. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. I'm so glad to see you. I need to leave the meeting because I have other meeting. We so. Yes. Yes. We'll, later. yes. we'll ask you tomorrow. I mean, on Thursday. Okay. Bye. Yes. So now we want to ask uh, Lindsay Weitzman. Hi, everyone. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, it's good to see you. It's really dark, spooky over here. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so grateful for you guys organizing this. It's really, really exciting to have something to focus on and to connect with all you guys. Um, I'm based in Santa Cruz, California. I just moved here a couple months ago. I moved in with my sister. I came from the Northeast of the United States, um, most recently Providence, Rhode Island. Um, primarily, I'm a printmaker. I work in a lot of different mediums, including like painting and sculpture. Um, I have made videos and I'm kind of hoping to use this time as an opportunity to get back in that. Um, that's my dog. She sounds like Chewbacca. <laughs> Um, anyway, the most recent projects I've been working on have been um, solar plate etchings. I've been really diving into how my practice and the materials I use can sort of reflect the ideas that I'm working with more. So for years, I've been sort of exploring, you know, how are we related to our environment and the sort of creation and destruction that humans have been a part of for as long as history. And just really diving into that has brought me, you know, closer to certain spiritual ideas that are definitely present in my work. Um, and this sort of this global connection that I think we're all sort of in a moment of struggle with. Um, and something that I think, you know, printmaking is this really old practice and why aren't we evolving our tools and techniques to be better for the environment, to be better for ourselves, 
So that's just one aspect that I've been working with in my process. So these solar plates are developed with just water and UV light. Um, so just kind of also where I'm living now, I, I went from having a really large garage studio space to having like less than 100 square feet. This is my press behind me and my bed above me. Um, so it's really exciting to just work in such a simple way and really challenge myself. And I have sort of had memories of being at other residencies where, you know, your resources are limited or you have to start fresh or you're traveling and you don't have that much with you. And just really tapping into what really matters, you know, and when you move across a country or you move far away and you have to really boil down to what's really important. And I think, you know, these times are really exciting for that. We're all facing this challenge and, you know, it can be overwhelming, but it can also be this really exciting challenge. And I think we all have that choice. Um, so on that note, something else I kind of think about is this sort of polarity and dichotomy between I guess this disconnection, but at the same time, intense connection, you know, on, on more of a maybe spiritual level or understanding of this human experience that globally we're all sharing. Um, so there's like, you know, it's a really dark time, but there's also these silver linings that I'm just trying to focus on, I guess. Um, so yeah, my work, um, I think the pieces I sent, one of them's a solar plate. Mm -hmm. They are based on photographs I took in the Canary Islands. I've been really attracted to volcanoes for quite a while. And I think a lot of that is like this um, beauty and this draw to it, but it's also dangerous and, you know, it brings destruction and, but it also brings creation, you know, when the lava cools. So um, anyway, the solar plates are images, photographs I took in the Canaries, mm -hmm. and then I turn them into solar plates and I, they almost look like planets now. Like everyone seems to think they're planets, but there's these tiny little hints of, human activity, whether it's like a small little car in there, but it's, I guess, this idea of kind of abstracting the landscape and the sort of like human manipulation through this process. Um, so then, yeah, that's what I've been working on. Thank you, Lindsay. Yes, uh, yeah. the, the very, um, what I find really interesting in, in the practice is also the idea of, of distortion, because a lot of these terms that you actually mentioned are actually connected to the invention of the Americas. We mm. say of beauty and dangerous, how landscape has functioned as discrimination, uh, how this idea about um, plants and mm. specific way of reporting uh, certain ways of seeing is also connected to race and how the invention of race as a form of hate and ideology has informed the Americas. And I find really, really fascinating how you're rethinking that by not only the technique, you know, how do we make it less aggressive, but also this allows other kinds of images to emerge and how that creates a sort of distorted perception. So we will explore that as well when we think about place, when we think about mobility, when we think about picturesque, because knowing the rules of how our history has framed specific ways of seeing allows us also to subvert or interrupt that legacy to rethink what kinds of images we are actually making and in, in what way they um, reconnect with other possibilities in terms of the encounter and the person. Awesome. Yes. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay, so now we want to connect with um, Rusty. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yes. I awesome. Um, hi, well, thanks for uh, doing this. This was supposed to be my first day of my residency in Peru today. So that's, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to be here with all of you. I'm already just like blown away, but I am not nearly as deep or interesting as anyone else here. So, uh, but I, uh, I live in, Dallas, Texas, far north suburb. Uh, I've been to Architopia and Oaxaca in 2018 and 19 uh, to uh, work on, uh, uh, one time was to work on a personal essay and the other time was to work uh, on a, sh a short story. Um, and I've kind of discovered, uh, well, I discovered at Architopia, but also um, this, uh, enforced quarantine has really um, 
uh, like nails it home that uh, I really am the one artist who just doesn't have time to create in my because now I have nothing but time and all of a sudden I'm like getting uh, getting things published actually so um, although you did, there is like kind of the downside like oh all it took was the end of the world and now I'm a now I'm a published artist so I have that uh, that will always follow me but um, yeah I primarily write fiction um, I uh, just had a uh, a uh, personal, a short personal essay published, and uh, that journal actually wants me to write another piece for them about. Um, uh, I mean, I lost both jobs on the same day because of of the shelter in place orders, and so I um, now I am uh, dealing with. Um, I, I feel like I've done everything right, and uh, the Texas Workforce Commission continues to pay me zero dollars a week, uh, which. Uh, I thought uh, at least I have, you know, nope, no, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills, which is uh, a terrifying moment. Um, but that's, uh, I'm, I'm here to, I'm here to just uh, work on, um, I have a, like a whole lot of unfinished uh, work that I've accumulated over the last couple of years. And I'm just going to uh, be here to work on that. Um, I, uh, I, I, I was really struck by uh, Taylor's talking about, um, visual culture and escapism and hyper reality because those are uh, the kinds of modes that I work in in my stories with uh, um, the, the utter disposability of pop culture right now and uh, like some of my stories take place inside of video games or in a dating website questionnaire or um, uh, you know uh, one of them is about a, a reality TV show host who loses his job um, so it's it's a uh, it's it's uh you know but also there's also always in in my work a a, a kind of a, a tension between those on the outside and the inside um and so that's uh yeah that's that's kind of uh that's kind of my stuff so. tell us about the projects that you are still working on what, were the priority, what are the themes what are the questions that you're exploring? yeah um so i'm still working on uh, the story as i was working on last year uh, because I literally have worked two jobs pretty much every day since I got back, um, which is a a story that takes place inside of a home. Um, it's it's about uh, it's about grief. It's about family. It's about um, how uh, since I went to Architopia, it's about how the home is kind of a sublimation of the woman who is expected to keep the home. And and how they're and how society has kind of made, um, and a society of expectations has kind of made those two things indistinguishable from one another, um, which has opened up so much of the grief aspect that I wanted to write about, um, because because the the house does change, um, and uh, when 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 we're grieving and it, when anybody is your house changes. Um, it's it's a uh, so I'm I'm definitely going to be working on that. But it's uh, I also have um, uh, I think one of the stories I I submitted was is uh, is kind of a collective stream of conscious that is uh, it's I don't know how well I'm pulling it off yet, but I'm it's attempting to be in a dialogue with Susan Sontag's uh, the way we live now, mm -hmm. which um, is brilliant technically, but it. Uh, it it kind of rubs me the wrong way because it uh, it was about rich Manhattan people who had the time to deal with their friend who was dying of AIDS in the late eighties, early nineties, and I mean it was just soaked in privilege. And um, you know, thankfully, uh, thankfully HIV is not the life sentence that it used to be, but there's still a huge uh, epidemic of suicide and. Uh, depression, well, depression, but suicide um, in the LGBT community. So I tried to write a story that um, is in is in dialogue or in concert with that earlier very famous piece, but addressing kind of the more what's more the reality on the ground today. Mm -hmm. um, at least, at least from what I've experienced and the people I've lost and and uh, the 
you know, all of that. So that's uh, that's something I'm I'm actually working on, like literally today. It's open on my computer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's yeah. Yes, because these these themes are actually more relevant than ever uh, in, in terms of how we understand um, place and, and history. And, and one of the, the challenges that we are going to face together is to rethink the problem of class. Because as you're mentioning, um, even when we think about the experience of groups that have been minoritized, for instance, uh, women, women usually have more in common with their oppressors than actually with women as gender, as an invention. So we'll think about those, those questions because when we think about the conversations about social change, usually race is being addressed depending on the region of the world, usually gender, even in Mexico, gender and race are conversations that are happening, more gender than race. Race doesn't mean as much as it means in other places, but there's never a conversation of class or there's always a very limited conversation in terms of class. So we'll think about what does it mean if gender is something we do and not something we are, then what does it mean in terms of class? Class is something we do, not something we are. So this, this will be the process to decenter ourselves. And this is terminology that we've been using, but we'll contextualize it with the readings to begin or to continue expanding on these conversations and the possibility of um, change, although it can be predicted, but at least interrupting history. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that I think that's one of the other ones literally is um, that, that I uploaded to y'all is, is, a, is a story that I'm still revising um, that is actually finished, but I'm, well, finished, a draft is finished. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is, it's, uh, it's about um, two people who are both experiencing grief and loss, but their stations in, in life and especially at the event they are prevent them from making any sort of genuine human connection. And so that's, this is, this is all stuff that, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to dig into. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. No, absolutely. So we have a few minutes still for one more. Um, before I, I forget, uh, I'm going to also add another task on the classroom uh, platform so that each one of you who have different uh, social media, including Instagram, including Facebook, including email, will have a contact list so that we can follow each other's processes in that sense. If we have blogs, if we have website, if we have Facebook, Instagram, anything you wish to share, I'm going to have a section, we're going to have a section in the classroom chapter so that you guys can actually share it. And um, we're also going to upload samples of the work of each one of you so that we can also begin connecting these conversations with the work that we're actually making. Um, we want to ask uh, Emily Kirstner. Um, Emily, are you there? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. How are you? It's good to see you. Hi, good to see you. It's really, uh, it's really nice to see you, and this is great. Thank you so much for for organizing this. Um, it's uh, it's fun to get to get to hear a little bit about everybody. Um, so I did Architopia in Oaxaca in 2017, um, and I did the embroidery res residency there. Um, I live in Oakland, California, USA, um, and uh, we've been, you know, we've been hunkered down for about a month now. Um, I'm also a, a high school teacher, so that's been an interesting um, change to get used to teaching online the last month or so. Um, and um, so uh, I, I, I'm going to show, actually, I just have a couple of art pieces here, and I'll just kind of briefly show them. I thought that would be um, fun show and tell. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I mostly make uh, textile-based work, um, and I also do some book binding. So I would say uh, pretty much everything I make is uh, made with cloth and or thread and or paper is really sort of like the, the unifying, unifying materials. Mm. So I have a, um, a recent, um, I have a recent journal I made. It's like a Coptic bound, um, Coptic stitch journal. And I'll try to show it on video the best I can. Um, so I really, I really like to use found materials and, and repurposed materials. Um, so for this work, I, uh, I used art papers uh, that I found at a, a neighbor's yard sale. 
and this item is actually going to be bartered with my neighbor. Um, I'm going to give her some of the art papers back in the form of, of this journal. Um, and I also kept some for myself. Um, sorry, trying to talk and show at the same time here, but you can see um, each like folio of the, of the, of the journal is made with the art paper. Um, and the outsides of the journal are made with like a, like an old notebook um, and everything is Coptic stitched and I'll show that here. Um, and so I, I really like to use found and kind of repurpose materials in my work. Um, and, um, and I, um, I was going to add that I, I'm, I'm always interested in my work and kind of the like personal demands and connection to capitalism that we all have, um, certainly in um, using recycled materials as opposed to new ones. Um, and also just in sort of my own connection to my work. Um, I'm interested in um, questions about like time and labor and productivity. Um, I really got interested in embroidery a few years ago because uh, it, it 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 takes so long, um, and and I think for some people that's that's tedious. But um, for me, it kind of helped me to work through a, like a need to kind of live at a faster pace and be productive all the time. Um, and you know, certainly, like sitting there stitching and and trying to finish a piece, you know that that's that's a kind of a reframing of of like a need to be productive. Um, but it felt to me like a meaningful way to kind of um, kind of question my my usual ways of thinking about like working and being productive, um, and and really a way to kind of slow down. Um, that's something I really appreciate about about the medium. Um, and then I, uh, I'm definitely interested in, in alternative economies. Um, and I, um, I really, I have not sold very much artwork, hardly anything, but I, but I've like bartered and traded, um, things that I've made. And I also often make things that are that, like, that are useful, right? Like, like a notebook or I embroider on clothing, um, things like that. Um, and I've, I've given a lot of things as gifts. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in kind of thinking through and questioning um, how the sort of demand to make money and use time productively again um, can sort of be um, rethought um, or how people um, can can find other forms of um, of of collaborating of trading um, of of getting each other's needs met met um, in in different kinds of ways um, and um, definitely in my textile work I I operate with an awareness of um, the kind of traditional gender um, kind of connection with with textiles um, and um, definitely the traditional connection with like domesticity and being in the home. Um, I, I, I guess I'm I'm interested in um, kind of the value and the power in um, in 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 those skills um, that were not always like um, valued in public, you know, um, and 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 the value in those forms of expression that um, have not have not always been made public. Um, something that really stuck with me from my time um, at Architopia was um, hearing Francisco talk about light and shadows in in people's artwork. Um, I really appreciated that as a way. Uh, to get away from just sort of being like, oh, well, everything is problematic, right? Um, and because it's true, it is, right? Um, we can we could we can poke holes, we can criticize um, uh, somebody's kind of kind of the the impact that their work is making, or um, the kind of potential to just sort of reinforce some kind of a social norm. Um, I think that's easy to do, um, and I find myself. Um, I have, I have that tendency sometimes, um, but I think it's more interesting to think bo both about the push and the pull, the light and the shadow. Um, and I think that helps us as artists kind of take responsibility for, for the potential for shadow, um, as well as not, um, not be paralyzed by it um, and, and um, not, not have that keep us from, from making, you know, um, but be more, more rigorous in our work. Right, right, thank you. Yeah. Yes, because a lot of what we and, and what we've learned through the process is that many artists, writers, creators in general get paralyzed after the process of, of confronting what you're making. But it's also a reality that we will not stop creating. 
because as as uh, artists, writers, you know, as as we create, there's that's the only way we can understand our existence. So it's a matter of figuring out, as you're saying, how do we challenge the 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 idea of place, the idea of history, and and when you mentioned this idea of labor, labor has been used historically to distort time and class and labor. When we think about, for instance, Oaxaca and how uh, communities that are labeled or imagined as indigenous, they are fixed in the past as a place. Therefore, labor is absent. Therefore, income is reduced. So how we think about these distortions of time and, and uh, space and time into history, it's, it's very relevant. And as you're mentioning, and this is very exciting also, to think about alternative economies, how the bartering system in Mexico and other regions of the world have allowed many communities to survive. So maybe that's also a possibility that we can think of. Maybe there's a possibility of exchanging the work through, uh, you know, uh, the digital world, but also the physical world, you know, we can think of different possibilities to collaborate with each other. I am starting to see all these different layers in which we are connecting themes, techniques, materials. So I see a lot of exciting possibilities. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, we still have, uh, we're halfway of, of in the list of participants. We still have Haley, Sarah, uh, Shoko, Kevin, uh, Mariana, uh, Daniel, Casey, oh, sorry, Daniela, uh, Casey, uh, Sarah uh, Sibling, and, and also Sarah Pedlo that I mentioned before, uh, Karina, Anna, and John, and also um, Donali, uh, Christian, and Amanda. And we're going to continue in the next session with the introductions, and then we will begin also unpacking the readings that I already uploaded. Before uh, we end these sessions, do you guys have any questions at this point? Anything that you want to comment about? Anything that you want to ask about? This is the moment to ask any questions you might have. Sure, um, I'll ask a question. Um, uh, is there an expectation that people will um, share with the work that they're creating, will, will that come up a little later? Um, that would be helpful to know if 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 there's any need to kind of I don't know bring bring something in a format that could be more more easily shared. Yes, we will create a section. We already have most of the images, most of the documents from each one of you. So we're going to create a section in the classroom uh, platform so that each one of you can actually see each other's work and also can share. Uh, because our residencies are process-based, I also encourage all of you to, I'm going to create another question there section of some kind where you can actually mention your Instagram information, Facebook information, blogs, website, anything that can show also process because images are very limited, text sometimes is also very limited. So um, Let's uh, create this section so that anything that we have, we can share as part of the process. Yes, and if you have any suggestions about apps, anything because yes. I'm getting old, so anything that you can suggest of apps and other ways of using connectivity, more than welcome to, to join that, that um, possibility. Mm -hmm. I think there are other questions. Jesse? Jesse? No. no. Who had other questions? Fawn? Uh, oh, uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. I just wanted to know how to get into Google Classroom, but I'll email you. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll send you a tutorial for that on, on YouTube. I'll also help you set up the, the platform so that you have access to the readings. And I'll be doing that all day today and tomorrow so that any any issues with the technology, it can help you with that. Yeah, mine. there's something wrong with mine. And I'm also getting old in personality. So I'll help you with yeah. that. Cool. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, Camila. Um, would you like us to share that we're doing the residency? Like, would that help you or social media? Yes. Okay. I think that it's process. Uh, it's always very generous because it, it not only 
shows, uh, you know, the image of the final work is fascinating and complex, but the process is what helps also teach and learn. We can learn from each other. Yeah, and also I think it's a good idea because we know all the projects, but it's also good, like we've been taking notes and we can see how different projects can connect either in teams or uh, like material. So that's that would be really useful also for the rest of the artists who are in cool. the session. Yes, and, and a few things that I'm also seeing in the threads of the chat, um, we have to figure out how we're going to collaborate with each other beyond also beyond creating this space where we have a possibility of breathing outside of whatever is happening in the world. Um, and a few ideas that I have is uh, what Emily mentioned in terms of bartering, uh, also the possibility of exchanging uh, physically or online. I am thinking also of a few exercises where we can all work together in, in a theme maybe even the idea of the home as a place and how we can distort that to bring back the notion of time and space. I also see a lot of uh, connections between printmaking and the stamping of images, the engraving of images. So maybe we can think of a, of a portfolio that we build together. There's also the possibility of an open studio, maybe even lectures after these residencies over. I'm also, and, and something that Nayeli also uh, was thinking about and that I see also in the threads is maybe we can have groups where we can discuss and work together. I see Rusty and Taylor uh, connecting with, with this idea of uh, hyper-reality. So we should start rethinking and for the next session, please bring any ideas of how we can collaborate with each other and, and in groups and also, uh, you know, as, as, as a whole um, community. Yes. Yes. Um, perhaps we could do a hashtag. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Easier to search. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. I have a question. This is Mark. Yes. Mark. Yeah. Uh, the question is the readings that you've uh, sent out already. Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to share those, uh, or our thoughts about those? Do you want us to write those down and send them to you? And does that get sent around to the rest of the group, or how does that work? Yes, it is It is possible um, to begin with questions in the platform, and, and you you all can add to the questions, uh, I mean, as, as answers and comments. Um, I also ask all of you guys to bring questions regarding each one of the readings. I will be pulling... Uh, specific points so far in relation to what each one of you have uh, talked about in your project so that we can begin connecting, but bring questions, bring any uh, quotes from the readings that you think are interesting or that you disagree with or that you don't understand or that you want to expand, you know, anything that is useful. And also we should take, uh, we should use the platform as much as possible to share because we have limited time, uh, some you know, in, in these sessions to share everything. But online, there's a possibility to upload images and to share comments, and I'll also begin creating threads so that we can actually share all these different questions in relation to our practice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other questions at this point? Well, it's been wonderful. I'm, I'm really excited because, you know, for many years we've been thinking, how do we bring the best of Architopia together? And it took a pandemic to, for that to happen. <laughs> you know, you never know how things are going to come, but this is very exciting. Each one of you is bringing um, very generous knowledge uh, and, and the possibility of reconnecting in, in different spaces. So far, I know we have uh, some of you in the United States, Mexico, Canada, Bolivia, Peru, uh, the UK, uh, and uh, Ireland, I think also, oh, and Kevin, yes. So, um, and other places because each one of us carries uh, the idea of home and house and all of this in different ways. It's very exciting. I want to thank you all. Uh, oh, also, Daniel, I think she's in Switzerland or Europe uh -huh. somewhere, yes. So, um, let's be patient with each other. You know, these sessions are very generous and I'm, I'm very excited. In the next session, we will cover the rest of the participants and then we'll begin to unpack. 
And from there, uh, please also bring other ideas of how we can break into groups, how we can interact, how we can share. Um, any last comments before we sign off? Thank you so much. This session has been recorded. I will share it with all of you also in the link so you can all access it. And, and this is very exciting. I want to thank you all. And, and this is what Archetopia is. So this is, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. See you next Thursday. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, bye. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>